This is a response to P.P. Simmons' video, Evolution's Shameful Secret, What Does Science Really Say? Well, P.P., it seems that you've been polluting the internet again by peddling your distinctive brand of deliberate misinformation and downright dishonesty. So once again, I've taken it upon myself to correct you on one or two things that you said. It seems that since the last time I addressed you, you've developed a distinctly unhealthy interest in sex, a subject that appears to be growing in popularity amongst YouTube creationists. Unfortunately, it's also evident that you've made the mistake of thinking about it a little too much because it's led you to conclude that the very fact of its existence disproves evolutionary theory and that the acceptance of said theory necessitates support of the abuse and mistreatment of women. As you might imagine, I hardly concur with these assertions and in fact find them extraordinarily offensive. Allow me therefore to outline the true nature and extent of your quite astonishing twattishness. Here is a simple little secret the evolutionist doesn't want you to consider. The evolutionist and the creationist are both looking at the same scientific evidence and facts. So the creation-evolution debate then is not really a debate over the evidence. Everyone is looking at the same evidence. It really is a debate over philosophy. That is, how does one ultimately interpret the evidence that they're looking at? It should be quite evident to anyone who's seen my two previous rebuttals to some of your material that you're certainly not looking at the same evidence as the rest of us and that you've just proved yourself to be nothing less than an ignorant douchebag or a blatant serial liar. In your butterfly scale video, you used one layman's article to spend five minutes on nothing but arguments from ignorance and personal incredulity while I read over a half dozen peer-reviewed scientific papers and reviews to educate myself on the subject before responding. And in your chirality video, you essentially read verbatim from one article, this time written by a creationist chemist and deposited on a creationist website, which, as I pointed out in my response, made absolutely no mention of any of the scientific evidence that utterly eviscerates your and your friend's astonishingly uninformed arguments. Still think we're looking at the same evidence, PP? Or were you just lying again? I suspect it was the latter because I could hear the sound of your voice. Now let's hear a little more about your thoughts on philosophy, shall we? Therefore, science itself doesn't really say anything. Scientists do. And how one philosophically interprets the evidence before them really is very crucially important to other conclusions that must be drawn. Thank you for your introduction to your friend the fucking obvious. Science is a set of rules and guidelines for the systematic evaluation of the natural world that allows us to develop useful and predictive models and explanations of reality. Of course it doesn't say anything, it doesn't have a mouth, or from your perspective, an asshole. Science constrains mankind's philosophical inclinations within the bounds of what can be objectively observed, measured and verified, and since this precludes the fanciful stories of your and others' religions, it's not surprising that you and your kind choose to reject it and ignore any empirical evidence that shows that they're just that, stories. This is clearly demonstrated here by your painfully obvious attempt to shift the goalposts from a debate on the actual objective evidence which can't be refuted by anyone with even a modicum of intellectual honesty to one on the subjective views of the parties involved. Nice try, PP. And it might have worked with a fellow creationist, but you'll have to do better if you want to deal with people who are capable of reason. So we'll get back to philosophy in a minute or two, but first let's hear what you have to say on the subject of natural selection. The evolutionist says that there is no intelligence behind creation. The driving impetus for all of life, all 20 million species of it, is natural selection. The random, non-intelligent, accidental process that produces everything we know as life. Oh, for fuck's sake, PP. You could have at least have attempted to make an effort to be original, but instead you once again give us a demonstration of your duplicity and your dishonesty. And that's because it's impossible to believe that you've not seen enough evolutionary material to know that gene duplication, mutation and sexual recombination are the main arbitrary parts of evolution. While natural selection is non-intelligent in the same way that gravity and electromagnetism are, it is far from random or accidental. Neither is it one of the driving impetuses of all of life, but rather the simple process by which the environment favors phenotypic variations that are better suited to survive within it. And yet, despite knowing this, you still insist on misrepresenting the facts and the science with no regard to personal integrity or honor. The only thing this clip established are your absolute lack of any kind of common decency in debate, and what a spectacular tool you are. When then did the sexes originate? How did the sexes originate? How is it that they could have, for they would have to have, originated 
at the exact same time with all reproductive functions present and working in both the male and female in order for the species to continue. On top of that, how is it that every species, which is most of the 20 million species, that reproduce sexually, male and female, how is it that they arrived at the same time within their species and with all of their parts working? You do realize, PP, that the horse you've been so ineffectively beating shuffled off this mortal coil a long, long time ago, don't you? All of these questions have been answered with recent thought and backed up with real physical and experimental evidence and I'm not going to waste my limited time here on doing what your parents and school system should have done by educating you properly. Instead, I'll point you towards three superb YouTube videos by CDK007 that do a sterling job in addressing all of these points. I highly recommend you watch them before asking these questions again and making yourself look like an unimaginably ignorant buffoon. I will, however, point out that your naive assumption that in the absence of magical pixies in the sky, the sexes for each species would have had to have appeared simultaneously with private parts fully compatible reveals your complete ignorance of evolutionary theory and your unquestioning belief that living creatures can actually be conjured fully formed from thin air. It astounds me that you actually think that this somehow poses an intractable conundrum for the theory of evolution when in fact it is beautifully explained by it. In, in reality, reality, no evolutionary, evolutionary biologists have ever stated that the sexes of each species appear in a single generation, genitals swollen with gametes and ready for action because they are well aware that it is populations that evolve and not individuals, a fact that you are either unaware of or once again happy to ignore. Reproductive systems evolve slowly by gradual modifications that were compatible with the rest of the population. Those that were not would not reproduce, while those that resulted in more efficient fertilization were favored. Do try and think about it, PP. It's not that hard, you know. Why? Why would sexual reproduction have randomly originated through the natural selection process when it takes so much energy? The whole premise of natural selection is that it randomly seeks the path of least resistance, the least amount of energy expenditure, and the most beneficial processes to the species. What a crock of shit. Have you no shame, PP, or are you really so dumb that you actually believe what you're saying? Natural selection favors the propagation of individuals best suited for survival in their given environment. That's it, period. It has nothing to do with solely energy expenditure or the path of least resistance which you presumably pulled from a rather unpleasant part of your anatomy. Sex does indeed extract a substantial energetic price, but rather than asking yourself whether there might be some compensating benefit that might outweigh this expense, you simply jump to your default position, your answer to everything, you guessed it, God did it. As it happens, sexual organisms benefit in terms of the enormous increase in the genetic and phenotypic variation produced by the random mixing of parental alleles. This produces more varied populations that are better able to adapt to changes in their environment and therefore survive. All this is commonly and easily available knowledge, PP, so how is it that you act as if you are completely unaware of it? I think that the next clip will shed some light on the matter. Now, to be honest, some evolutionists have attempted to give answers to each of these questions. But regardless of their answers, here is where the philosophy of evolutionary conclusions comes into play. So, PP, it seems that you are aware that the answers to your questions have already been provided. This just makes your utter lack of sincerity and honesty all the more distasteful. I find it very interesting that you admit to knowing that science does have explanations for the origins of sex, but rather than trying to find real arguments to counter the specific points presented or the data that underlie them, you settle for dismissing them out of hand and pathetically trying to steer the topic away from the scientific evidence. So with that said, let's take a look at the specific point you've been so long-windedly trying to get to. Why and how then did natural selection make, generally speaking, women weaker? So you see the result of this wonderful evolutionary natural selection process is then that men are by far dominant and women have been more abused, less powerful. Evolution gave women the horrible short end of the stick. Therefore, according to evolution thinking, women are necessary only for producing babies and can be abused. Of course, no evolutionist would admit this, but this is the conclusion at which one arrives when evolution is your philosophical interpretation of the scientific evidence. You disappoint me, PP, because that truly wasn't worth the wait. Is that really the best you can do? 
If so, you may want to reconsider what you do with your spare time. All I can say is that this is certainly not the conclusion of evolution thinking, but of a warped and twisted mind that's willing to say anything to support its deluded, intellectually unsupportable and ludicrous beliefs. Nothing can damn you more than your very words, PP, and I think you did a tremendous job here in demonstrating the depths to which you're willing to sink your dignity to defend your position. No wonder I have to check the soles of my shoes every time I watch one of your videos. I'll finish this portion by pointing out that evolution merely describes how species have diverged and continue to diverge from a common ancestor and not, despite your vulgar assertions, how, having achieved sentience, we should treat each other and other living organisms. Acceptors of the fact of evolution no more have to believe in the inferiority of women as the followers of deities have to believe in the superiority of cabbage. You can project all the negativity you like on the rational PP, but that doesn't mean that any of it has any basis in fact because they have long since unshackled themselves from the barbarism in which your religion is so deeply rooted. Your despicable accusation only shows your willingness to brazenly slander anyone who refuses to participate in your particular delusion at the drop of a hat. Or it could be that God purposely created humans, male and female, equally glorious in creation. Man and woman were created to need each other to be complete. However, our fallen condition, our sin nature, as clearly portrayed in the Bible, has caused the warped view and treatment of women. I suppose that technically that could be PP, and that he also left absolutely no physical evidence for his work. In fact, just the opposite, that he planted a never-ending mountain of evidence to speak to the contrary. But then again, maybe it was someone else's God that did it, or even one that humans are completely unaware of. Is there any possibility that you could provide us with even the smallest shred of evidence to support your particular line of shit in favor of anyone else's? I doubt it. It's also clear that you haven't even paused for thought with regard to the consequences of your groundless speculation. Let me throw a couple at you. If your God did create man and woman, then why did he make women weaker? You claim he's omniscient and omnibenevolent, so he must have known that we would become sinful. With that in mind, why didn't he make women at least as strong as men so they could stand up for themselves? Bit of a dick, really, isn't he? Also, if it's human sinful nature that leads to this abuse, then why is it that the book that you claim to be your God's very word repeatedly denounces women as wicked while at the same time denying their right to free speech and promoting their inferiority, their status as property, their rape and their violent murder? In your worldview, it seems to me more likely that the mistreatment of women isn't due to mankind's sinful nature, but to your God being a complete and utter dipshit. You really should take more care in choosing the non-existent entities that you choose to blindly worship not to mention the crap that you seem to be intent on inflicting on us. Science, in and of itself, really doesn't say anything. Scientists do. We interpret the exact same scientific evidence before us. One starts with, there can't be a God. The other starts with, there must be a God. Has it ever occurred to you that a thousand years ago, pretty much everyone started with, there must be a God? That all changed over the past 400 years, and by using the tools of the scientific method, great men with the bravery to change their minds finally amassed enough evidence to allow them to conclude that there probably is no God, or if there is, it certainly is not one of the primitive entities currently imagined by the petty simians that live on an utterly insignificant speck of dust floating at the verges of the cosmic infinite. And meanwhile, despite your assertions to the contrary, you continue clinging to your primitive beliefs not by looking at the same evidence, but by doing everything in your power to avoid examining it, by ignoring its very existence, by telling the most detestable and despicable lies to discredit it, and by denying it no matter how irrational or idiotic it makes you look. I don't care if you choose to live your life in ignorance and not enlightenment, PP. I really don't. It's your loss, not mine. But do be aware that as long as you keep trying to spread your poison to others, keep demeaning the achievements of those who shadow your unfit to fall under, then I or someone like me will be there to take you down a peg or two and show you up for what you really are.